Imagine being abducted by aliens. Imagine being taken aboard their spaceship, subjected to a series of tests and being terrified out of your mind. That's what Travis Walton claims happened to him back in 1975. Walton's story is one of the most controversial UFO cases in history. Some people believe that he was telling the truth, while others think that he was lying or suffered some sort of mental breakdown. But one thing is for sure, Walton's story is gripping and intriguing. Hi folks, I'm Johnny and welcome to The Oddest. In this video, we will explore the Walton abduction case in detail. We will examine the evidence, hear from witnesses and discuss the various theories about what actually happened. We'll also try to answer the question, was Travis Walton abducted by aliens? People have been buzzing about UFOs for the longest time, sparking curiosity in some and skepticism in others. Recently, there's been a fresh wave of information if you don't know what I'm talking about or referring to, then here's a wee rundown. So on July 26, 2023, the House Oversight and Reform Subcommittee on National Security held a public hearing on Unidentified Anomalous Phenomenon, or UAPs, commonly known as UFOs. This was the first public hearing on UFOs held by Congress in over 50 years. The hearing was sparked by a whistleblower named David Grush, a former intelligence official who alleged that the government has been covering up evidence of UFOs for decades. Grush claimed that the government has recovered downed UFOs and non-human biological materials from crash sites. Three retired military pilots also testified at this hearing, recounting their own encounters with UAPs. One pilot, Ryan Graves, said that he saw a fleet of UAPs flying over the Atlantic Ocean back in 2019. He described these UAPs as being white, tic-tac-shaped objects that were able to outmaneuver his F-18 fighter jet. The Pentagon has denied Grush's claims of a cover-up, but they have acknowledged that they are investigating UAP sightings. In June of 2021, the Pentagon established the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, or AERO, to centralise the investigation of UAPs. The AERO is still in its early stages, but it has already made some progress. In May of 2023, the Aero released a report that identified five potential explanations for UAP sightings. 1. Airborne clutter. 2. Natural atmospheric phenomena. 3. US government or allied technology. 4. Foreign government technology. And 5. Other. This report also stated that the Aero has been unable to explain the majority of UAP sightings. This suggests that the government still has a lot to learn about these UAPs. The US congressional hearings on UAPs in July of 2023 were a significant event. They showed that the government is taking UAP sightings seriously and that it is committed to investigating them. The hearings also raised awareness of this UAP issue among the public. Opinions are split, with some believing in extraterrestrial life and others not giving it much thought. But let's dive into this intriguing tale of Travis Walton, which stands out in the world of UFO stories. Before we started tossing around terms like organic non-human life forms, which is just a fancy way of saying aliens, there's this captivating account from 1975 involving a guy called Travis Walton. He was a young logger from Arizona, and he claims that he was whisked away by a UFO. Some folks take every word he says as gospel, while others suspect the whole thing is nothing but a big fabrication. So as we look into this bonkers and terrifying story, let's keep one question in mind. Did it actually happen? Travis Walton was born on 10th of February 1953 in Snowflake, Arizona. He was the third of seven children born to Mary Walton. Walton grew up on a ranch outside of Snowflake and attended Snowflake Union High School. After high school, he worked as a logger for a few years. In 1975, he was a member of a seven-person logging crew that was working in the Apache Sitgraves National Forest. This whole incident, also known as the Fire in the Sky event, went down on November 5th, 1975 in the Sitgraves National Forest near Snowflake, Arizona. Travis, a 22-year-old at the time, was part of a logging crew of six guys working alongside his close buddy Mike Rogers. What occurred that night became one of the most prominent UFO abduction stories ever. 
On that particular day, the crew had been putting in a hard day's work in the forest. Now, when you think of Arizona, a vast desert might come to mind. But, surprise, surprise, they were in a massive forest being cleared for logging. So picture this. It's Wednesday the 5th of November, 1975, as I said, just an ordinary work day for Travis. They wrap up their work at the Apache Sip Graves National Forest and Travis, along with his six-man crew, is heading back home. As they are descending the mountain in their truck, they notice this incredibly bright light piercing through the trees. So they drive closer and it becomes clear that this source is a strange craft. The truck comes to a sudden stop and Travis, showing some serious guts, decides to hop out and investigate. So there's this strange metallic craft hovering silently in the clearing. Travis has already bailed out of the truck and is moving towards it. From the truck, his fellow crew members are screaming at him just to get away and get back to the truck. Travis estimated that the object had a diameter of about 15 or 20 feet and was roughly 8 to 10 feet thick. Its shape resembled two oversized pie pans placed lip to lip, with a small rounded bowl inverted on the top. The white dome peaked slightly above the ship's upper outline and darker stripes with a dull silver sheen divided the glowing surface into panel-like sections. The dim yellowish light emanating from the craft had the sheen of hot metal fresh from a blast furnace. They couldn't spot any visible antennae, protrusions, hatches, ports or windows on the craft. It appeared completely motionless and soundless, almost like it was suspended dead in the air. Suddenly, he was startled by a sudden surge in the volume of vibrations coming from this craft. It sounded like numerous turbine generators springing to life. He instinctively crouched down just as a blinding blue-green ray shot from the bottom of the craft. In an instant, his senses were overwhelmed. He saw and heard nothing. All he felt was an electrifying jolt, as if struck by a high-voltage surge. This intense bolt made a sharp cracking sound, and Travis was enveloped by the stunning force of this beam, striking him fully in the head and chest. His consciousness rapidly faded into a deep, unfeeling darkness. From the moment that he felt that paralysing blow, he lost sight, sound and sensation altogether. The men in the truck witnessed Travis's body arching backwards, limbs outstretched as the force of the blow propelled him off the ground. He was thrown clear through the air, landing about 10 feet away. His right shoulder collided with the hard, rocky surface of the ridge. Lying there lifelessly, he lay sprawled out on the ground. The entire forest lit up brighter than daytime. All the crew members, including the boss and truck driver, lose their wits and hightail it out of there just as fast as they can, leaving Travis behind. These guys have obviously never seen Band of Brothers, right? The guys were thumping the back of Mike's seat and screaming for him to get the hell out of there. Well, Mike didn't need to be told twice. He was already frantically searching for the ignition switch. His trembling fingers eventually found the key and the engine roared to life. Mike pushed the truck through the boulder-strewn trail, swerving this way and that as he navigated the treacherous road. Is it following us? He shouted over his shoulder. No one answered. Is it after us? He yelled once more. When no reply came again, he turned to see the crew, their faces frozen in shock, staring straight ahead with vacant expressions. The six seasoned woodsmen were reduced to a state of mindless terror in response to the horrifying spectacle they had just witnessed. So, after that bizarre encounter, the crew had no clue what they had just seen. They were completely puzzled, but a few minutes later they decided to go back and help Travis if they could. When they returned though, Travis was nowhere to be found. They searched around for a while, but it was like he had just vanished into thin air. With no other options, they drove into town and then contacted the local sheriff. At 7.30pm that night, Ken Peterson, a member of the logging crew, made a frantic phone call to the local sheriff's office. He reported that their friend Travis had gone missing. Deputy Sheriff Chuck Ellison rushed to the shopping centre in Heber, Arizona, because that's where the crew was gathered. The men were visibly shaken, with two of them unable to hold back their tears as they described what they had witnessed. Deputy Ellison, I mean, he had a hard time believing their surreal account. He thought, if they were faking it, they're doing a remarkable job. He decided to inform his supervisor, Sheriff Marlon Gillespie, who arrived an hour later with another police officer. They listened to the harrowing story from the six loggers, with Rogers, the lead crewman, insisting on going back into the forest to search for his missing friend, even though they didn't have any sort of tracking dogs with them. As the three remaining crew members 
still too upset, decided to head home to share the news with their families and friends, the search party began to grow. More police and volunteers joined the efforts at the location of the alleged alien encounter. Despite their thorough search, the police officers couldn't find any physical evidence to support the logger's story. This obviously raised doubts about the credibility of the account and heightened concerns that Travis might be lost or in danger succumbing to the cold. The following day, so November 6th, Mike and another officer, Ken Copeland, well, they paid a visit to Travis's mum, Mary Collette, who lived on a small ranch in Bear Creek, which was about 10 miles outside of Snowflake. When they told her what had happened to her son, Mrs Collette remained remarkably calm and reserved. She simply asked if anyone other than the police and the folks who were there has heard this story. Officer Copeland found her reaction and behaviour quite unusual, which made the police even more suspicious that there might be more to Travis's disappearance than this UFO abduction story. Early that morning, officials and volunteers gathered once more to comb the entire area, but they still couldn't find any signs of what happened to Travis. This only strengthened their suspicion that the UFO story might be a cover-up for some sort of accident or even something more serious like foul play. By the afternoon, the police had already left, which infuriated Mike and Travis's older brother Dwayne. They thought that not enough follow-up searches were conducted. Later on that day, the police launched a more extensive search for Travis. They brought out the helicopters, officers on horseback and jeeps to scour the area. Strangely, despite the odd bluish-green light that had forcibly lifted Travis into the air and then dropped him on the ground, well, there was no evidence of an explosion, there was no blood, torn clothing or any signs of a physical struggle, even among the loggers themselves. After the strange incident, investigators separately questioned the six witnesses, and they all shared remarkably similar descriptions of what they believed was a UFO. Mike Rogers described it as a large, glowing object hovering just below the treetops, about 100 feet away from him. Dwayne described it as smooth, emitting a yellowish-orange light, and other witnesses had similar observations, describing it as an unbelievably smooth, flat disc with well-defined edges. Their accounts of the events leading up to Travis's disappearance were consistent, which they hoped would prove that their story was true. In fact, Mike and the five other men were willing to take lie detector tests to support these claims. On November 8th, three days after this puzzling incident and with Travis still missing, the crew members underwent polygraph tests conducted by Cy Gilson, a polygraph examiner from the Department of Public Safety, associated with the Arizona State Police. Mr Gilson asked them critical questions, such as whether they had caused harm to Travis, whether they knew who might have harmed Travis, or even if they knew where Travis's body could be. He even asked them if they were actually being truthful about this entire UFO story. All the men denied causing any harm to Travis, or knowing who may have harmed him. They denied all knowledge of a location of Travis's body, and insisted that they had indeed witnessed a UFO. Five of the crew members passed the polygraph examination no bother, while Alan Dallas, well, he couldn't complete the test, so that one was declared inconclusive. Part of Mr Gilson's official report stated that the polygraph examinations confirmed that these five men had indeed seen something that they believed to be a UFO. Furthermore, the tests showed that Travis Walton had not been harmed or murdered by any of these men on that Wednesday night. In the end, five out of the six men were found to be truthful according to the exam results, making them convincing witnesses. The polygraph examiner thought that if the UFO story were fake or a hoax, then these five men had no prior knowledge of it. Once the test results were released, Sheriff Marlon Gillespie announced that he accepted the UFO story as true, believing that the men were telling the truth about the Travis Walton alien abduction incident. This announcement understandably caused a stir. News of Travis's disappearance and the unusual circumstances surrounding it soon attracted the attention from international news reporters, UFO enthusiasts and curious individuals who travelled to Snowflake to investigate. During one interview, Duane revealed that he and his brother Travis had a shared keen interest in UFOs and would have jumped at the chance to get as close as possible to a real UFO. Additionally, Duane mentioned that he himself had witnessed a UFO incident similar to his brother's back in 1963. Shortly after these interviews, Snowflake's town marshal declared that the entire incident was a prank orchestrated by the Walton brothers. 
He claimed that they had tricked the logging crew by releasing a balloon at just the right time. However, the marshal's wife, she came out and said that she disagreed and thought that her husband's explanation of this balloon was just as far-fetched as Dwayne Walton's UFO story. The authorities wanted to preserve the scene of the incident for a thorough forensic examination, but this became impossible due to the flood of local and international visitors who all flocked and came to see what actually happened. People had mixed reactions to the story. Some admired the courage of the crewmen and believed their account whilst others labelled them as liars or pranksters, suggesting that the whole thing was nothing but a misguided joke. Many wondered when Travis would suddenly reappear, leaving everyone to question, where is Travis Walton? The 11th of November 1975 marked Travis's return, and with it came an even more bizarre tale that began to fill in the gaps of his mysterious disappearance. The last thing that he remembered after approaching the UFO in the forest was being struck by a beam of light, and then everything went dark. When he woke up, he was in excruciating pain, overwhelmed by thirst, weakness, and struggling to breathe. A brilliant light hovered above him, and the air felt thick and humid. As Travis slowly regained consciousness, he initially thought that he was in a regular hospital, surrounded by three figures dressed in orange jumpsuits, which he just assumed were medical practitioners. But as his vision cleared, he realised that these were not humans. These were nightmarish beings. He described them as having a basic humanoid appearance, standing less than five feet tall with bald heads and no hair. Their heads were oddly large for their small bodies, almost resembling oversized fetuses. The most unsettling aspect of these creatures was their eyes. They had huge, almost entirely brown eyes, with very little white visible. These eyes seemed to penetrate right through him. They lacked eyelashes and eyebrows, and their noses, ears and mouths, well, never really moved. Travis went on to describe them as slender, with delicate hands that had no fingernails, and skin that looked something like the surface of a marshmallow. He tried to fight back and push away the closest creature, but it felt squishy and gave way easily. With a shaky voice, he shouted at the bizarre beings to get back. In desperation, Travis grabbed an unbreakable glass-like cylinder from a nearby shelf and started waving it around and brandishing it like a makeshift weapon. In a sudden and unexpected twist, these beings retreated from the room, leaving an open doorway. This gave Travis the chance to escape the examination room via a dimly lit hallway. He soon found himself in a dark, spherical chamber, where a solitary high-backed chair sat in its centre. As he approached the chair, the room illuminated like a planetarium, stars swirling across the curved ceiling. When Travis stood, the starry lights vanished, revealing what seemed like a rectangular outline on the wall. A potential door. Curiosity compelled him to search for it, but then a sound caught his attention from behind. Slowly turning, he saw a tall figure in a sleek blue bodysuit and a glassy helmet. Their eyes were, also unusually large, gleaming with a bright golden hue. The strange being guided Travis into a colossal chamber, resembling an aircraft hangar. It, it was that big. Travis's eyes widened as he realised that he had just departed from a disc-shaped craft, eerily similar to the one that he encountered in the forest just before that eerie bluish light took him. However, this craft was at least twice the size of that one. Within moments, Travis was ushered into yet another room and gently placed on a small table. A woman, bearing an uncanny resemblance to the tall, helmeted man, handed him an oxygen mask, which he reluctantly put on. Before he could resist, Travis felt himself growing drowsy and eventually passed out. Attacking more fully, just making way past them. The only doorway I could see was on the other side of them. And it looked like a doorway? Yeah, it looked like a doorway, just a, you know. And what did they look like? Uh, I guess it's a pretty typical description nowadays. Uh, very large eyes, uh, hairless, um, two eyes, nose, mouth, I didn't see them speak or no change in the expressions. That was the most terrifying experience of my life. But when I, when I tell this story and try to relate to people, I'm trying to communicate what I experienced and how 
utterly, utterly traumatic that was and how it was so devastating. I was, you know, on the verge of catatonic for weeks after it happened, but... Uh, when he awoke, it was a chilly night and Travis found himself outside a gas station in Heber, Arizona. One of the disc-shaped crafts hovered just above the highway, disappearing into the distance a few moments later. Unbeknownst to Travis, he had been absent for five whole days, while he had only assumed that a few hours had passed. Desperate to make sense of this bewildering ordeal, he reached out to his brother-in-law Grant Neff. Grant was initially sceptical when Travis called, but eventually made the drive to Heber with Duane to bring him back home. Upon his return, the missing man from Snowflake, Arizona, became the centre of attention, besieged by UFO researchers, authorities, profiteers, sceptics and the media, all craving details of this sensational story. But amid this chaos, Travis's family's main concern was his health. His brother Duane received a call from the Aerial Phenomena Research Organisation, also known as APRO, a civilian UFO research group. APRO pledged to arrange a thorough medical examination for Travis. The National Enquirer, renowned for its penchant for sensationalism, financed APRO's research in exchange for an exclusive interview with Travis. The medical examination ultimately revealed that Travis was remarkably in good health, with no traces of drugs or any other foreign substances in his system. In the midst of this shock and confusion, Travis found himself facing a polygraph test. The entire situation was quite the controversy because Travis and the examiner had a heated argument about how the test was being conducted. Nevertheless, Travis managed to pass two more polygraph tests later on. We'll come back to that. All of Travis's fellow workers who witnessed that eerie spacecraft also underwent these polygraph tests. Most of them passed with flying colours, except for one whose results were deemed inconclusive. As anticipated, there were those who dismissed Travis's tale as a complete hoax. They accused the media of exaggeration and claimed that it was just all a ploy to make some quick money. UFO researcher Philip Klass even went as far as to say that Travis's polygraph test was just poorly executed and he accused Travis of using deceptive tactics during the test. He also pointed out several inconsistencies in the stories told by Travis and his colleagues. Cognitive psychologist Susan Clancy had a different take on the situation. She suggested that Travis might have been influenced by a TV movie called The UFO Incident, which was about the alien abduction claims of Betty and Barney Hill back in 1961. Interestingly, this movie aired just two weeks before Travis's own supposed UFO abduction. Both Class and Clancy believed that Travis may have been inspired to stage his own sort of alien abduction, all in an attempt to gain some instant fame. And indeed, Travis became quite the sensation. As the case continued to capture the public interest, it became a media circus, generating headlines and sparking heated debates across the nation. Various investigations were launched, including polygraph tests administered to the crew members. These tests supposedly indicated no signs of deception, but their methodology and reliability were heavily criticised by some. From a biological perspective, there's an important detail about polygraph tests that many people may not fully grasp. Firstly, polygraph tests are not admissible in court. Many mistakenly believe that failing such a test equates to guilt, but the actual accuracy of polygraph tests is only around 50% or maybe even 60% at best. Despite claims of them being 80-90% to 90 accurate, this discrepancy is significant. It blows my mind how in the past the perception of these polygraph tests were crazy wrong and sadly they would lead to some awful results innocent people being locked up for life or worse. Even here in the UK there was a Jerry Springer style TV show called Jeremy Kyle. To say that this was utter trash TV is underselling it. There's a few YouTube videos on here that dives into the mental crap and horrible practices of that show. This show relied heavily on polygraph tests. These episodes would air and would supposedly demonstrate without a doubt that people were lying. Anyway, look, we're not here to talk about that nonsense, so let's get back to the story at hand. Here's how polygraph tests work. They rely on physiological responses like heart rate and blood pressure. If these indicators spike while answering a question, it's considered a lie because lying can unintentionally elevate these physiological responses. The issue here arises when someone actively tries to manipulate the results. They can intentionally raise their heart rate and blood pressure when answering straightforward questions, like 
what's your address or what's your pet's name. This artificially inflates their baseline. So when they do actually lie, well, there's no noticeable difference in their physiological response. Moreover, even when telling the truth, a person might misinterpret the question, leading to another physiological response that would register as a lie. The point is, look, polygraph tests are far from foolproof, which is why they're not admissible in court anymore. That's why investigators often don't place much weight on someone's willingness to take a polygraph test. If you ask me, these things equate to nothing more than silly pseudoscience and should be taken off the playing field completely. So, the huge overarching question is simple. Did it actually happen? Now, I feel the need to point out that, as with any video on this channel, I'm only reporting on what I've uncovered. I've not gone into this story with any preconceived bias as to its validity. Normally, I would say that if one were to completely and faithfully believe Mr. Walton, then they would only tell the story that supports that belief. The same is true if one were to set out to completely debunk it. There's YouTubers out there that completely make fun of it and call it outright crap. Conversely, there are some very famous YouTubers who completely ignore any evidence to the contrary and tell the story as gospel without looking at the evidence from both sides. It's important that we search for the truth. Five days after Travis' mysterious disappearance, his brother-in-law, Grant Neff, received an eerie midnight phone call from Travis, asking for help at a payphone outside a gas station in Heber. Neff and Dwayne, Travis's brother, rushed to the scene and brought him back home, but they kept it a secret from the police. Instead, they decided to drive to Phoenix the next morning to meet with a doctor. Their hopes were crushed when they discovered that this so-called doctor, Lester Stewart, wasn't a medical professional at all, he was just a hypnotherapist. The police were quite puzzled and somewhat annoyed when they only found out about Travis' return through the news a few days later. As neither Dwayne nor Mike had bothered to inform them, the police began to suspect foul play, or a hoax. To investigate Travis' story, the police looked into the phone booth incident. They confirmed that a call was actually made from that phone booth to the Neff home around midnight that night. But here's the funny part none of the fingerprints on the phone belonged to Travis. There were other unsettling aspects as well. While search parties were out looking for Travis, Dwayne and Mike, well, they spent all of their time giving interviews to UFO investigators. Among the recorded interviews that investigators shared with the police, two particular stories stood out. Mike Rogers admitted that he was in trouble with his Forest Service contract, and he seemed to hope that Travis' disappearance might somehow help him out of this predicament. Dwayne, on the other hand, revealed a strange secret. He claimed that both he and Travis had always been passionate about UFOs, believing in their existence. They even said that they had frequently witnessed UFO sightings together. What's more, they had discussed what they would do if one of them were ever abducted. Now, that in itself, that doesn't make them liars. I mean, come on, we've all thought about it or discussed what we would do in any strange given situation. Another significant character in this story needs to be addressed the National Enquirer tabloid newspaper. They had an enticing $100,000 prize for anyone who could provide proof that UFOs were of extraterrestrial origin. The Enquirer reached out to the Waltons and suggested that they take a lie detector test to see if they might qualify for this prize. However, Travis and Dwayne, they didn't really want to do that. So the National Enquirer, recognizing their concerns, offered a secret deal. If they didn't pass the lie detector test, well, the results would remain confidential. The Walton brothers agreed. I mean, wouldn't you? That's a win-win situation. If they pass the test, it just bolsters their claim and they get a hefty payout. If they fail the test, well, no one will ever know. The National Enquirer hired an examiner named McCarthy for the polygraph test. To their dismay, McCarthy described Travis and Dwayne's test results as the plainest case of lying that he had ever seen in 20 years. Dwayne was furious, shouting threats in frustration. As per the agreement, the Enquirer kept the failed examination hidden from the public for the longest time. However, local UFO investigators weren't convinced that this was a simple deception. So they arranged for another polygraph test conducted by an examiner named Pfeiffer. Pfeiffer reported the results as inconclusive, but the UFO group well, they changed it and publicly declared that the tests were positive, confirming the truth of Walton's story. It's worth noting that Travis later claimed to have passed his examination in his book. As the years went by, both of the other examiners, Gilson and McCarthy, 
They reviewed the results and agreed with Pfeiffer that they were inconclusive. This is the point where the story seemed to lose all momentum. Travis secured a book deal titled The Walton Experience and managed to make some money from that. It's widely believed, although never proven, that the book may have been ghostwritten by Jerome Clark, the editor of the International UFO Reporter. The National Enquirer eventually did pay up, though not quite the grand sum the Waltons were hoping for. Instead of the elusive $100,000 prize, they received a mere modest five grand for having the best UFO case of the year. Travis received $2,500 of the total amount, while the other six men, well, they got to split the other $2,500. As this story unfolded, it became clear that not all the pieces of the puzzle were lining up. Much of the information about the case, including the police initial suspicions and the suppressed polygraph test by the National Enquirer came to light thanks to the relentless investigation of Philip Class, a full-time UFO investigator from the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. Feeling the pressure, Mike Rogers proposed a new round of polygraph tests for everyone involved to settle this matter once and for all. He offered a seemingly fair agreement. If they passed, Philip Class would pay for the exams, but if they failed, the UFO group would cover the costs. However, this seemingly fair proposal had a twist. It was only valid if Class agreed to one particular examiner, a man from San Diego who had an unusual reputation. See, this examiner was known for administering polygraph tests to plants. Yep. See, he was attempting to prove that plants have feelings and he was going to do this with a polygraph. Fast forward some 18 years and Travis' book The Walton Experience was adapted into a movie called Fire in the Sky. The film took significant creative liberties with the story as the studio believed that Travis' own account, well, it just wasn't interesting enough. In conjunction with the movie's release, the studio arranged for Cy Gilson, the polygraph examiner who had originally passed Mike Rogers and the crew, to test Travis, Mike and one of the crew members again. Not surprisingly, they all passed the test with flying colours. Jerome Clark, a prominent UFO editor, has went on record as saying, After more than two decades, Walton's credibility survives intact. No shred of evidence yet brought forth against it withstands sceptical scrutiny. However, the truth is a bit more complex. The main issue here is that there's a significant lack of concrete evidence either supporting or debunking this story. First, let's talk about the absence of physical evidence. If Travis Walton had indeed experienced a violent encounter with a mysterious light beam, we might expect to see some sort of injuries, disturbances on the forest floor, or signs of trauma from his five days of disappearance. But none of this was ever found. Medical examinations fail to reveal any evidence. The primary support for the Walton case comes from many, many polygraph tests. Travis and his crew have often cited these tests as solid proof of their story, focusing on the positive results and completely ignoring the negative ones. What's more, when we consider the few physical testable aspects of this story that should exist if it were true, we come up empty-handed there's simply no concrete proof that anything out of the ordinary happened during Travis's disappearance. The alternative explanation, that this was a scheme by a group of young UFO enthusiasts looking for attention or financial gain, well, that seems a bit more plausible now. It's essential to apply critical thinking to any extraordinary story, like an extraterrestrial abduction. We should always ask for evidence. In the case of the Travis Walton story, the evidence falls short. It leaves us with more questions than answers and a significant lack of concrete proof to support these extraordinary claims. In 1958, there was a sci-fi novel written by Robert Heinlein called Have Space Suit Will Travel. Comparing the main character of this novel to that of Travis Walton, well, we find a few similarities. See, both of them have a fairly high IQ. They refer to themselves as a country boy and see their future in electronics. Both of them encounter a flying saucer at night, they're blasted unconscious by a blue beam, wake up lying on their back in a wedge-shaped room, are groggy and don't know where they are or how they got there, think they might be in a hospital, escape that room and go around a curved corridor, have the run of the ship for a wee minute, then find an object they intend to use as a weapon, they enter a control room of the saucer, and they describe it as having a hemispherical domed ceiling like a planetarium, they're amazed when star images appear all around them. 
then eventually returned to Earth many days later, dropped off at the side of the road late at night. They go into town, they phone for help and assistance, and both are shocked when they learn that it's not the day they thought it was. So there's maybe a little similarity or two there. I have no way of knowing whether the Walton brothers were Heinlein fans or if they even read that book, but Duane is on record saying that they were both lifelong fans of UFOs and science fiction. In March of 2021, something surprising happened in this Travis Walton case. Mike Rogers, a key witness, made a statement on his Facebook page saying, I, Michael H. Rogers, being of sound and rational mind, do hereby give notice that I am no longer to be considered a witness to Travis C. Walton's supposed abduction of November 5th, 1975. Later, Rogers explained that his decision was based on a secret Travis was keeping from him about a new movie remake of the incident. He felt hurt and angry because Travis had always kept secrets. He believed that Travis wasn't an honest person and he wanted to distance himself. In April, Rogers had a phone call with a producer named Ryan Gordon, who was working on a new film about the Walton incident. Gordon had recorded the call without Rogers knowing, which is legal and is allowed by Arizona law. Two months later, July 4th, Gordon publicly posted the audio from that call. All I can remember like, is that uh, we, were, we were talking in the woods one day, Travis and I, and uh, I, I remember leaving a chainsaw on a stump, okay? Uh, he had a saw that he took his with him because we were talking about uh, creating uh, uh, a UFO hoax, okay? Yeah. So there you have it. The story of Travis Walton and his alleged abduction by aliens. It is a story that has been debated and discussed for over 40 years. Is it true? Is it false? There's no easy answer. Some people believe that Walton's story is without a doubt. It's real. They point to the fact that he passed polygraph tests and that his crewmates corroborated his story in full. Other people are skeptical of Walton's story. They believe that he may have hallucinated it all or that he may have been abducted by humans and not aliens. They also point to the fact that there's no physical evidence of the UFO that Walton claims to have seen. Ultimately, whether or not you believe in Travis Walton's story is up to you. There is no right or wrong answer. However, I hope that this video has given you a better understanding of the case and has helped you to form your own opinion. In the meantime, stay safe out there folks, tell someone you love them, and above all else, remember, keep smiling.